people have seen me before. So what I'm going to do today is spend about 20 minutes uh, going through some of the big issues that are going today with China, with Russia, and with the economy. And then we're going to blow this open for Q&A. And you should not feel even remotely restricted in your questions to items that I'm discussing here. I just figured these were kind of the big three things I need to hit. Beyond that, we will go anywhere and anywhere and any when on any topic that you are interested in. So without further ado, let me bring this bad boy up. All right, uh, this is what's considered a standard demographic profile. Children at the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, men on one side, women on another. Uh, this is what most of the world looked like before the industrialization wave that occurred after World War II. Uh, but with globalization, this all changed because it used to be that we all lived on farms and you would have as many kids as you could put up with because they were free labor. Well, as many kids as you could put up with plus one because that's how you find out it's too many kids. Uh, but when you take an industrial job, which international trade made possible, those were all in the cities. And as you move off the farm and into the cities, uh, you have fewer of them because kids go from being a free, free source of labor to a massive expense and headache. And over the ages, the Korean demographic has shifted to this. The whole world has gone with the Koreans, starting from different points, going at different paces, but this has changed the economic structure of the world because when you're a young system like this, it's all about raising kids and buying homes and buying cars and going to college. Young people do all of the spending in a modern economic system. That tends to make it very inflationary. But an older system like this, it's all about the high value added workers who are doing everything they can to save for retirement. They've got decades of work experience, their incomes are high, their kids have moved out, so ex their expenses are low, and they're generating a lot of spare capital for whatever they need to do. What is going on right now is the world is changing from this to whatever is next. This was always the decade when a huge chunk of the world's advanced economies were gonna age from this structure like Korea's today into the next structure, which is one where we have more and more retired people, where that bulge that has defined economic existence going back to the 50s moves into a non-economically viable state. So if a young demography is inflation-driven and growth-driven, and a more mature state like Korea today is investment driven, technology driven, infrastructure driven, then whatever's next can't have consumption or production or capital because retirees are sitting on their capital in the form of T-bills and cash. They're no longer working, so there's no consumption and there's no production. We all make that shift at different times, but for most of the advanced world, this is the decade it all goes down give you an idea of what the neighborhood looks like. Start with the United States. We've got the healthiest demographic structure in the world. That doesn't mean it's perfect. You can see the bulge of the baby boomers in their 60s. So we're going through the same aging process as everyone else and digesting the boomers is going to be painful. But we also have the millennials down below who are rounding out the labor force in a way that is allowing us to have a more inflation driven system as opposed to deflation. You'll also notice that there's that big gap in the roughly five to 10 year olds. That is a mix of two things or three things. Number one, that's the uh, Gen Xers kids. Small generation generates a small generation. Number two, it's the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. When people aren't sure of their prospects, they tend to have fewer kids. And third, it's the millennials doing everything that everyone has ever done before them, just with a six year delay. And so that was kind of the bottoming out of the birth rate. You'll notice it's already coming back and preliminary data for 2022 and 2023 looks very positive. So we are looking at that base widening out again. But these shifts, these uh, ins and outs of the demographic structures, they're actually going to be the single biggest factor that is shaping the labor force, our capital markets, and our economic structure for the next 50 years. And that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone because that's how it's been so far. The same holds true in Japan on the whole demographics shape destiny. But here it's just that the birth rate has been so low for so long, they're well past the point of any sort of demographic regeneration. About all I can say that's positive for Japan is they've seen this coming and they've done some planning. 
automation in life, not in manufacturing, in life is more advanced in Japan than it is in any other places. They have robotic nurses, they've got hospital beds that turn patients, a lot of the stuff that doesn't require a lot of brains, but doesn't necessarily require eyes and hands has been automated. And that's allowed Japan to age relatively gracefully. In addition, the Japanese, while they can't accept migrants because they have such a firm sense of culture, they have been able to expand spending on things like childcare and healthcare to encourage young families to have more children. It's met with some success. And so Japan, while it is still the oldest demographic structure on earth today, it's no longer the most rapidly aging still in the top 10, don't get carried away. But Thailand, Korea, China, and Germany, and Italy are all aging faster, which brings us to Germany. This was always going to be Germany's last decade as an industrial power. They're aging too fast. They missed the point to turn the demographic ship of state 40 years ago. And they just haven't had much luck with immigra immigration. Uh, in the 90s, they were able to bring in roughly a million people from the former Yugoslavia. That helped. And then about 10 years ago, they brought in about a million people from Syria. The problem with the Syrian refugees, once you move past the cultural disconnect, is that these people were unskilled labor and they were 85% male. They didn't bring their families with them. And so it's a shot in the arm, yes, but it's no assistance for long-term demographic regeneration. There is a hope, perhaps, that they'll be able to pick up about a million Ukrainian refugees who are relatively highly skilled. It would be an easier carry to culturally integrate them. But at this point, the demographic decline is so far advanced that by 2030, the Germans will no longer have the workforce that's necessary to do the things that we associate with Germany. And that assumes nothing else goes wrong. Nothing with Euro, nothing with relations with the United States in terms of trade, nothing with the Russians in terms of energy. And all of that is going wrong too. And then finally, we get the People's Republic of China. Now this is already one of the fastest aging workforces in history ever. It's actually faster than the collapse of the workforces during the Black Death during the Middle Ages in Europe. We also know that this is not the correct data. Uh, only about two, three weeks ago, the Chinese released updated data that has since been incorporated into this graphic, showing that the birth rate has just collapsed. Uh, since 2017, between 2017 and 2021, the birth rate dropped by 40%. And that's before you consider the anecdotals we have out of China of what went down with the COVID crash, suggesting that it's fallen even further. So we're already in a situation where we have roughly half as many children as we, I'm sorry, children five and under as we have children aged 10 to 15, which is well past terminal. It was already past terminal, but this is, you're, you're looking at ethnic dissolution here with this sort of trend. And that assumes this data is accurate. The Shanghai Academy of Sciences is publicly trying to stir up discussion about how, because of the one child policy, people have been under reporting, I'm sorry, over reporting births and under reporting different statistics, especially when it comes to labor, in order to make the local provinces look better. And they estimate that the Chinese system actually has 100, fewer, 100 million fewer children than the data officially suggests. Uh, that probably means that that big gouge in the lower chunk actually plays up higher within the demographic structure. And those yellow bars probably don't exist at all. Uh, this is not a country in demographic decay. This is a country in the advanced stages of demographic collapse. And we don't have an economic theory as a species for what might make this work. It's obvious from the data that the Chinese have shared that consumption led growth will never happen in China again. They actually saw a collapse in things like car sales back before COVID. They've never rebounded. And now with the, um, the piss poor recovery we've seen post COVID in China, we now know that consumption is not part of the equation. This graphic indicates part of why. And we also know that while their labor costs have gone up by a factor of roughly 14 since the year 2000, their worker productivity has barely doubled in most sectors and it's reached only triple in some of the more advanced ones. China is no longer the low cost environment for manufacturing. It's just the place where all the industrial plant happens to be 
Now that's not nothing, but that's not enough to justify a long-term investment in the system. And every subsector that has tried to reshore out of China has words has discovered shorter supply chains with more effective labor, with lower energy costs, less political risk, closer to the end consumer. All right. Um, on the off chance you don't buy the Chinese economic argument, I wanted to bring this graphic up. Now, for those of you who have been following me for a while, you know that back in 2014, I predicted that the Ukraine war would happen in 2022. Now, I don't say that to toot my own horn, although, you know, but instead to underline that that was only one of three major global military campaigns that I saw shaping this decade. This graphic has the other two. It's an oil flows graphic. So any country that has, I'm sorry, let me back up. The yellow bars are total energy demand within each individual country. The green bars are net oil exports. The red bars are net oil imports. And you'll notice that the green bars and the red bars on the whole are inconveniently far, far apart. Right now, most tankers going from the Persian Gulf to Northeast Asia follow this purple line that follows the coast. Based on where you start and where you finish, that's five to 7,000 miles long. In a scenario where things in East Asia get a little punchy, the Americans do a trade embargo, the Chinese go for Taiwan or anything in between, the Chinese have the military capacity with multiple weapon systems to interrupt that purple flow line which means in the case of war, the purple flow line won't be used. Instead, tankers will use this longer flow line that's deep sea. It's an extra 4,000 miles, but it avoids most of the weapon systems of most of the countries in play. The Chinese only have one weapon system that could reach that. They need satellite eyes on the target in order to hit the targets at that range. And the Chinese have no capacity for space combat, whereas Japan and the United States in particular have excessive abilities. So in a post-globalized world, you should expect one of two things, or two of two things. Number one, things in the Persian Gulf get a little dicey without the Americans there to hold the Saudis and the Iranians apart. That puts half of all global maritime oil flows in the crosshairs. And then number two, you get a naval war in East Asia for any number of reasons. If oil flows use the green line instead of the purple line, the Chinese are screwed. They can't access that at all. But Japan has a fully blue water Navy, even without its partnership with the United States. And those flows can be convoyed and protected. So whether it's because of demographics or political collapse in China or an energy conflict, the Chinese don't have a candle to hold up to this wind. We're going to see the end of the Chinese system within a decade, one way or another. All right, let's talk about the Russians. Uh, first, the map on the left, you're looking at the Russian space, the green zone, that's the Russian wheat belt, that's where everybody lives. The blue and the yellow are tundra and tegai for the blue and desert for the yellow, completely economically worthless. The problem the Russians have always had, however, is the beige. Territories that are flat, that are easy to invade through, but economically worthless. So there's no point in the Russians developing them. There's just too much territory for the Russians to guard. So the Russian strategy has always been to advance to a series of geographic barriers that you can't run a panzer division through, and then concentrate their relatively technologically inept forces in the access points between to prevent invasions from ever reaching in. Russia's been invaded 50 odd times in its history. And with almost without a, oh yeah, and almost without exception, the only times that the foreigners have been ejected has been because of bad weather. It's very, very rare that the Russians on the ground have actually been the deciding factor when it comes to what the foreigners do. So from the Russian point of view, it's not just that Ukraine is some of the best land in the former Soviet Union. It's on the way to two of these most important access points one in Poland, one in Romania. So the Russians were always going to try this. And when they're done with Ukraine, they're always going to push further. People forget that this is not the first post-Soviet war. It's the ninth. 
and all nine of them were instigated by Moscow. This isn't Putin. This isn't Putin's current elite and cabal. This is Russian policy going back over 300 years. This war was always going to happen. And the demographic pyramid gives you an idea of why it had to happen about now. That big gouge in the 20 somethings, those are the children who were born in the post-Soviet collapse. That's the last generation of Russia. Now, if you look down into the red zone, like the teenagers, uh, especially five to 15, it looks like it gets bigger. It does by the official data, but about 15 years ago, when this number started to boost out, that's when the Russians started stopped reporting how they were collecting the data. And a lot of circumstantial evidence from within Russia suggests that they just stopped collecting the data altogether and just started making it up. And that made their birth rate look better. Well, you should probably consider that big gouge in the 20s to be not just the last accurate data, but that probably drops straight down, meaning that roughly a third of the children in Russia just don't exist. So this is the last generation that the Russians have to even attempt to solve their territorial issues with military means. And so they are. All right, uh, let's talk about where we are in the conflict right now. On the left, you have a population density map. On the right, you've got a transport map, uh, mostly road, the dotted lines are rail. The areas that matter are actually not in Ukraine. This empty zone is the Arkhakon Desert. It's about the size of Utah. Nobody lives there. There's no infrastructure there. Here's the problem the Russians have. This arc is populated Russia, and it allows access not just to eastern Ukraine, but all the way down into the Northern Caucasus, which is a territory that is most assuredly not populated in a majority sense by Russians. This is the land of the Dagestanis, the Chechens, the Agaevs, and so on. You'll notice that for the most part, the infrastructure follows the population patterns as you'd expect. So Russian control of the Northern Caucasus is predicated on the concept of Russian control of Eastern Ukraine. There's only one transport route of size that is an exception to that, and it's the blue M4 line that is highlighted on the infrastructure map. Now, the most important places in the war are these two population centers. In the north, that's Belgorod. That's the city that served as the logistical and support hub for Russian activities in northern Ukraine, including the siege of Kiev and Kharkiv. And in the south, you have the city of Rostov-on-Don, which is not only a massive transit point for energy and agricultural shipments out of Russia, it's the only logistical and support hub for the entirety of Russian operations in the Donbass and especially the Crimea. If you remember the Kerch Strait Bridge, everything that goes over the bridge comes from Rostov. And then of course, everything with the Donbass fighting as well. The problem the Russians have is if they lose control of Rostov, this war is over because they can't get forces into Ukraine. But if they lose control of rostov on don they also lose control of the Northern Caucasus. So a couple things to keep in mind here. Let's assume that for argument's sake, the Ukrainians are wildly successful with the current counteroffensive and they actually drive the Russians completely out of their territory by the end of the summer. Let's just assume that that happens. The Russians aren't going to stop. They see this accurately as a war for their existential survival. If they don't pacify Ukraine and the lands beyond in this conflict, then they will have a completely unmoored defensive strategy that has insufficient troops over the long run. And while I don't think the Germans are going to march into Russia anytime soon, this is the last chance the Russians have to get a more defensible perimeter. They will push until they can't which means Ukraine, one way or another, has to end up in Rostov. They have to break up that logistical capacity so that the Russians cannot even try. And if they do that, Russia starts to dissolve because it loses control of not just its Ukrainian frontier, but its Caucasian one as well. So this last weekend when we had the Wagner coup, which uh, we can talk about that as much as you guys want to, Wagner made its temporary headquarters the logistical hub of rostov on don And for several days, all logistical and ammo support and fuel shipments to the entirety of the Russian front stopped. 
and the Ukrainians are taking advantage of that interruption right now. Oh yeah, ethnic map. Red is Russian, hashed red is Ukrainian, and you can see very clearly that it's a complete mess down in the Caucasus. If the Russians lose the ability to project military power to the Caucasus, they will lose control of it. At a minimum, we will have a third Chechen war, and that will be the beginning of the end of the Russian system. All right, one final general monologue here. Uh, let's talk about what's going on with the economy and tech and banking and with the Fed. Okay, um, the whole idea of the tech sector is you're imagining things that don't yet exist. And to do that, you need two things. Number one, you need a not so small army of wired together 20 and 30 somethings who are young, intelligent, creative, skilled, and collaborative to imagine the future, to develop the prototype, to figure out how to operationalize it, and then to go into mass manufacturing, to design that system. None of those steps generate any income. So the second thing you need is a near bottomless supply of very, very cheap capital. We're no longer in that environment anymore. The oldest baby boom, excuse me, the oldest millennials turn 44 this year. There will never be any fresh millennials in their early 20s again. We have passed the peak of what they can contribute to this sector. And capital costs have already gone up by a factor of five in the United States. They probably have a ways to go, more on that in a minute. But we're never going back to the capital and labor environment that we've enjoyed these last 15 years. So tech was always going to take a bit of a breather. There's also the question of whether or not we can carry anything forward. For products that have not been operationalized yet, we now have a capital and labor shortage. We're going to have to focus on a few very specific things that have already been brought to that level of operationalization. Now, it's possible that artificial intelligence is one of those things. The release of ChatGPT last fall is a really promising sign that that has already made it over the hurdle. But just the software, that's not enough. ChatGPT, AI in general, requires massive volumes of computing power. And we're probably not going to have the amount of chips that we need to build the server farms that we need to do this at scale. Now, there's three types of chips in the world. At the low end, you've got the ones that come out of China that are 90 nanometer and bigger. These chips are near analog. They can only do one or two things. This is what's in your smart light bulb. This is what's in the Internet of Things. Uh, there's about $1,000 of these low end chips in a Tesla just to handle the basic left right stuff. We're probably going to lose all of that. Now, we can rebuild that capacity elsewhere, but the Chinese are 80% of global supply. The other 20% comes out of Japan and the United States, and we, we don't have to reinvent anything here. We just have to build the fab facilities, but just means a minimum of two years. Four is probably more realistic. So that low-end stuff, that's going to take a big breather. Then you've got your high-end stuff, 10 nanometers and smaller. This is gaming consoles. This is iPhones specifically. This is a lot of high-end servers. And above all else, it's AI. AI chips are the most advanced ones we make. They're 4 nanometer and smaller. And 90% of those come out of Taiwan. Now, a lot of folks suggest that this is a reason why the Chinese would invade Taiwan. I don't see it that way a couple things to remember about the Chinese. Anything below 10 nan or above 10, 10 nanometer, they have no chance of. In fact, you really have to go down to about 40 nanometers before they can play at all. But 40 to 90 nanometers, kind of the mid-range dumb chips, they do produce at scale, but they do so with imported equipment, imported software, and imported labor. Now, I'm sure there is a diversity of opinions on this call about Joe Biden. I know I have at best mixed feelings myself, but one of the things the Biden administration did last uh, November, September, last fall, uh, is he told all Americans who were working in the Chinese chip sector, and most of the foreigners are Americans, that they now had to choose between their citizenship and their job. And within 24 hours, every American employed in the sector was either transferred abroad or quit. The Chinese tech rise is already over. They can't make the hardware that they need on the mid-level to do anything that they need, much less the high level. So if the Chinese were to conquer Taiwan tomorrow without firing a shot, it wouldn't matter at all 
because they wouldn't know how to operate the facilities. In fact, most of the designs come from the United States or Japan. So, you know, those wouldn't flow anyway. But even if they did, the Chinese wouldn't know how to operate these things because they can't operate most of their own without foreign help. Now, there's also an issue about what happens to the chip environment anyway. This, the, the 10 nanometer and smaller chips are made in Taiwan, yes, but they're not designed there and the equipment doesn't come from there. There's a constellation of 9,000 companies around the world that allow us to make those high-end chips. Very few of them are in East Asia at all. But if anything happens to globalization, we lose part of that constellation. And of those 9,000 companies, roughly half of them only produce one product for one customer, and there is no global equivalent to the product that they make. If we lose them, we lose the capacity to make that piece of the puzzle. Um, I'm not so much worried about Taiwan. I'm worried about places like Germany, which is where all the lenses for the lithography come from. You can even imagine a scenario where California gets a little wonko with its policies and we lose the ability to make the lasers that make the lithography possible. It doesn't take a lot of countries falling out of that coalition for the entire thing to break down. In fact, one or two would be plenty. And rebuilding, that would be difficult because that constellation, that, that hyper-specialization at every point of the process has literally required decades of global peace, cheap capital, and ample labor on a global scale. That's not our environment anymore. We can do it, we do it in less than 10 years. So we're gonna lose the low-end chips because China's going away. And we're gonna lose the high-end chips because we're losing globalization. Now, it's not all bad news. Those low ends, that high end, that is only 20% of all chips by value. The middle 80%, everything from automotive to aerospace to most people's phones to power management things at utilities, all of that stuff, that's in the middle. And there's more than one player. In addition to the Chinese, you've got the Americans, the Italians, the Germans, the Koreans, Taiwan again, and Japan. There's a redundant system for building this. There is no single point of failure. So if China falls off the map and globalization breaks, we will still have most of the chips that we need. What we will lose is the ability to digitize the low end. And what we will lose is the ability to push the frontier at a rapid pace. All things considered with everything else going on in the world, that's a scenario I'm actually pretty positive on because it means we don't lose anything we have. The digitization we've done the last 15 years, most of that holds. There are exceptions, of course. I'd hate to be Tim Cook right now because he's going to lose his entire chip system. Okay, in this environment, globalization breaking down, demographic aging, changing the market rules, I am thrilled that we've only lost four banks. Moreover, the four banks that we've lost were non-standard. All of them were tech banks, and tech banks work differently. Throughout the rest of the system, people raise capital either by taking out loans or issuing stock. That's not how it works in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is primarily driven by venture capital and you get your cash mostly in lump sums. So what the, the people who run the startups do is they take that lump sum, they park it in a bank, and then they just draw upon it as they need it for payroll and costs and resources and everything else. What happened with the four banks that went under is the depositors got spooked and they yanked their capital. Well, the banks had just basically put all of that capital into things like government debt and they couldn't liquidate fast enough. And then when they did liquidate, they had no assets. So it was a very, very non-standard bank run. Normally what happens is you get loans that go bad for a bank and then the, the bank runs out of operating capital and people pull their money out and you get a collapse. That hasn't happened anywhere. Uh, so to double, I'm sorry, quintuple the cost of capital in the United States in under a year, the fastest increase in capital costs in American history, and only have four banks using a non-standard metric and, and business model, only have four go down, I feel pretty good about this. And I think the Fed does too. Now, when the Fed looks as done in order to rein in inflation, I think they're pretty pleased with themselves. We only really have two sectors and a lot of pressure. Housing, because it's driven by interest rates and mortgage rates, and tech, because it's risen by capital. But 
tech was already on its way down because of the labor situation. And housing is an unfortunate side effect of what's going on because we really do need several million more housing units. But ultimately, the Fed is not overly concerned about what it sees. I, I, I phrased that wrong. The Fed is very concerned about tech. They're even more concerned about housing, but they don't consider that the real problem. The real problem is demographics. Because while the United States still has a positive demographic profile, most of the advanced world doesn't. And what is monetary policy? What are interest rates? Except a series of tools that are designed to regulate consumption. You want more consumption in order to get inflation up, you lower capital costs by lowering interest rates. You're concerned that inflation is running too fast, you raise interest rates to tamp down demand and get inflation under control. That's, that's how it works. That's how it's always worked. Well, with Germany and Italy and China and Japan and Korea and the rest aging out, they will never have consumption driven economic growth again. And so the Fed isn't so much worried about this economic sector cycle. The Fed is worried about the next one. When the United States and to a lesser degree, Mexico and Canada are the only economies in the world that are capable of responding to monetary policy. The Fed isn't worried about this cycle, it's worried about the next one. Because if it knows that if it does not have enough dry powder to stimulate demand at the next time around, then that's it. The rest of the world will never recover and the United States will at best fall into a Japanese style malaise where economic growth is zero in a good year. So the Fed needs as much dry powder as it can possibly get. They're not going to stop before 6%. They would really like to reach nine because they're worried about the monster that's chewing on the horizon. If they get this wrong, if they don't have enough tools, we will not see economic growth for at least a generation. And that is something that is a far worse situation than the inflation environment that we're seeing right now. Okay. Um, little, let's see, the QR code on the left that goes to the newsletter and video log, it is free. It will always be free. And I will never share your data with anyone. Now, if you happen to read or view something like, yeah, I would have paid for that. I suggest you kick a donation to the link on the right. Uh, MedShare is a charity that I am sponsoring right now. They provide medical assistance to communities who have lost the ability to look after themselves for reasons that are beyond their own control. So, for example, if the Russians are bombing your power grid, MedShare will step in to help hospitals with diesel generators. This link goes specifically to their Ukraine page. Okay, that is it for the opening comments. I went a lot longer than I thought I would. Apologies for that, but that still leaves us with plenty of time for you guys to grill me. So, uh, Vic, take it away. Great. Thank you, Pierre. Appreciate that over overview. And we have already started getting people uh, typing questions in. I'm going to get to those. Uh, but with respect to some of the topics you just covered, uh, Peter, uh, particularly with respect to Ukraine, uh, you know, it's been dragging on over a year now. I think everybody thought that the Russia would run right over Ukraine. It hasn't happened. Uh, and at the recent events in the Wagner Group this past weekend, and then this morning, uh, two generals missing, um, one of them who has the nuclear suitcase and hasn't been seen now for a while, uh, both uh, he and is it Sorokin, Sergei Sorokin. Uh, what, what is this telling us about, A, uh, what's going on with respect to Putin's control, and what, how is that going to impact the short-term and the long-term Ukrainian issues? All right. So the key thing to remember about Russia, it's not a normal nation state. It's a multi-ethnic empire. And the political system that evolves from that is nothing like what we're familiar with here in the United States when it comes to elections or accountability. I mean, our system is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, by the, of the imagination but Russia really only has two options for ruling its territory. One is strict military dictatorship like we saw under the Soviet Union. And the other one is the more czarist issue or style of balancing various forces. So for that to work, the czarist strategy, it is very dependent upon the personality and the mediation skills of the leader himself. Now, in the case of Putin, Putin comes from St. Petersburg and the people who are ruling the country right now are his cadre back from when he was vice mayor in Petersburg back in the 90s. And in that era, 
what Putin discovered personally is that the most reliable tools in order to force the population to do what you want were organized crime, because you could call upon them to assassinate people who were problematic, to extort folks, to keep problems in line, to keep the foreigners at arm's length, all that good stuff. And so that entire constellation of people that he used in Petersburg are now the folks that are running Moscow. Now, there are other political and economic factions throughout the Russian Federation, a lot of them headquartered in Moscow, and they don't really overly care for this setup. And that has made it difficult for Putin to exercise control over the military in the same way that, say, the Soviet Union would did. Uh, so what he did is the logical thing. He took one of his people from St. Petersburg, a by the, guy by the name of Shoigu, and put it in charge of the overall national military. Shoigu is great at manipulating organized crime, and he's probably the most corrupt person alive on the planet right now. In fact, uh, best guess is that one third of the defense budget for procurement for weapons and modernization, he skimmed off the top for him personally, and then the people under him took another third for themselves. One of the reasons why Russian equipment does not is not doing as well <laughs> as we would have expected it to do, and one of the reasons why the Indians are in the process of backing out out of all of their arms supply contracts because they realize that Shoyu just stole all the development money and they're never going to get what they've already paid for. Okay, so you play that forward to the, today's environment. This is not a government that uh, has a hierarchical system of control throughout all of society. You've got a guy at the top who has established himself as the ultimate arbiter to negotiate among the factions. And in order to get a little bit more flexibility, Putin personally created what we now know as Wagner to create a new faction that was loyal only to him. Well, like any other factional system, the factions rub up against each other. And in Ukraine, Wagner and the Ministry of Defense under Shoigu came into direct conflict. And so Prigozhin, who's the leader of Wagner, basically threw his coup in an attempt to force Putin to choose him over Shoigu, to elevate his faction and push down Shoigu's. What Prigozhin failed to account for is that Shoigu is not simply a crony of Putin. He's a really good friend. The two of them go back to their time in East Germany when Putin's job was to steal technology from the West, and they're each other, they're godfathers to each other's children. So it was probably unwise of him to ever uh, attempt this. And it's probably going to cost him his life before the end of the year. And we're already seeing a purge of the entire faction of Wagner. We've already seen, we confirmed that a number of the military leaders of Wagner at its various bases and operations around the world have already been detained and in many cases already shipped back to Russia. We'll probably never hear from them again. Wagner itself is being dismantled. Uh, the people who are personally loyal to Prigozhin have already relocated to Belarus, but it's not enough to make it a functional military force. And the rest of it's either going to be disbanded and or folded back into the regular Russian military. So that faction is being completely folded up. But the important thing for the future of Russia is this. When Prigozhin made his play, not a single leader of any of the other of the dozens of factions in Russia supported him. But when he made his run on Moscow, not a single Russian soldier stood against him. Putin is the manager at the top, but he commands nothing. And so we have gotten more insight into the real power dynamics of the Russian Federation in the last week than we got in the last 22 years. And it looks really, really bad because it doesn't take much disruption as we've just seen for one faction to overturn everything that Putin has done in the last 20 years. So the question now is what's the next shock? Because now all of the leaders of all of the other factions realize just how brittle the situation is. The last time this happened in Russian history, it was 1600. And the breakdown that happened is the factions fell into conflict. And as the czar lost capacity, as the country fell apart. It lost over one third of its population in five years from famine. And there's a foreign invasion that it saw the Poles occupy Moscow for a decade. Uh, they call it the time of troubles. I've always known that I was going to outlive the Russian Federation. It never occurred to me that could happen because the government would just fall apart. 
but here we are. All right, uh, thank you, Peter. So what is it, what's it look like if uh, a Russia, this war drags on, does China continue to support it, encourage a, uh, a peaceful resolution of it of some sort? And is that a resolution even possible if uh, Ukraine's saying, well, yeah, any resolution involved, you give it back to Ukraine. And yeah. one of the questions somebody posed was, what about the warm water ports that Russia's released? Yeah, in, in the aftermath of Izzy, uh, the, the massacres in Izium, Kyrgyzstan, and Bucha, uh, the Ukrainians know exactly what's waiting for them if they, if they lose. Uh, and so they will fight to the end because they don't have a choice. Um, and they also know very, very clearly that if there is a ceasefire, the Russians will just use that as a period to rest and rearm and recruit and then come at Ukraine again. So um, right now, there, there's no very, there's no clear momentum on either side, but it's the best that the Ukrainians can, it's the best bad situation that the Ukrainians can hope for. Uh, they know that anything that results in less than the full ejection of Russian forces and the neutralization of Belgorod and Rostov on Don is one where they just face another war in a few more months. Uh, so the Ukrainians will not accept any sort of peace deal unless it's forced upon them by the countries that are supplying them with weapons. Oh, and a quick word on that. There's a lot of shit going on out there about how we don't know what's happening with the Russian weapons, or I'm sorry, with the Western weapons that are going to Ukraine. Two things. Number one, we know exactly what's happening. Call your congressman because we have full reports of every individual javelin and stinger. Video footage is required to give back as part of the accountability processes. So there's really nothing missing here. I mean, yeah, if you're going to rob uh, Western assistance, but you're going to go after the humanitarian aid. Um, we haven't seen that happen at scale anywhere. So you know, don't 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 say you're asking a question. Don't say we don't know. We do know. All the data is there, and every congressperson has access to the full information. Uh, number two, with the exception of two Patriot batteries, every single piece of equipment that we have given the Ukrainians is stuff that was slated for dismantling anyway. It's technologies and weapon systems we haven't used since the '90s, and we were either going to destroy it or give it to an ally. Here we are. Okay, so that's that. Um, sorry, a little rant. People get me every once in a while. I hate it when people deliberately lie. Uh, what was the other half of the question? Uh, maybe I'm gonna move on to the different part of that question, which is how long can this, it's been a year. Oh yeah. Americans are known things stretch out. When does the support for the Ukraine just say, look, guys, we're done. It's been going on two years. We know Ukraine can't win it on data, its own. Data suggests we're going very firmly in the opposite direction both, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the Europeans have had it underlined very, very clearly to them what will happen if Ukraine falls. They know the next phase of the war, if Russia gets its way, comes for the European Union. Uh, and number two, on the United States side of the equation, a lot of the, the naysayers have been proven to be relatively foolish. And the removal of people like Tucker Carlson from being front and center of the American political conversation has really done wonders for people to look at this from a much more nuanced light and a much more honest light. Uh, so the more recent polls suggest that, in, that support in the United States for Ukraine has risen by about a third over the last four months, which is one of the sharpest political shifts we've seen in any question for the American citizenry in a very, very long time. As for how long we can maintain this, uh, remember that the United States, the largest expeditionary force in the world with a standing army of nearly a million men, has 30 years of back equipment that they can put into this before they start to affect the United States Army's regular military preparedness. The only weakness we have is with artillery shells, which we've used a standardized system for a while. And so we've tripled the output of our factories when it comes to building those munitions over the course of the year so far. We're going to need to triple that again. That is the soft spot in this. But when it comes to uh, the, the, the rank and file equipment that you use for the war, Challenger tanks, um, anti-aircraft, bullets, uh, all of that, we look pretty good on our side of the Atlantic. NATO, not so much. Uh, the Germans have already given pretty much everything that they can. And I know that people have given the Germans a lot of crap for not giving a lot, but they are the third largest donator of equipment so far. The big sticking point between the United States and the Germans is that the United States has wanted to give more faster. And the Germans are like, wait, 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 wait a second. It's not enough to train the Ukrainians on how to use our gear. We also have to train them on how to maintain our gear.
And if you think about in a war where things get broken all the time, that's a really good view when it comes to preserving war fighting over the long term because not one tank that goes there is not going to get shot at and you have to make sure it can participate in more than one battle uh peter so it's sticking with ukraine for now can you talk about the counteroffensive, how it's going what stage it is in and then the second part of the question will be crimea can the ukrainians take back crimea and if so how and what would that mean to the to the war and the rest of the world. Sure, let me bring up this bad boy map. Okay, uh, the red zones are the territories the Russians occupied at the end of the last war. The pinks are what they roughly currently hold. In addition, uh, the territory that they've captured in this war and held have held, and then the yellow is territory that they had but lost. Um, right now, the Ukrainians are doing two big pushes. Uh, the one going south from Zaporizhia, the goal is to get to the Sea of Azov so that they can then target the Kerch Strait Bridge directly. Now, if you guys remember last year, someone uh, blew up part of the Kerch Bridge. It used to have four road lanes and one rail lane. Two of the road lanes were destroyed and the rail line was so damaged it can't take cargo any longer. So what the Ukrainians want to do is if they can, that southern push, if they can get to the Sea of Azov, they achieve two things. Number one, that last road connection on the Kerch Bridge can be targeted directly, and that's the end of all supply there. And number two, if they can reach Azov, then land supply north of the Sea of Azov stops, and the entire southwestern front of Ukraine and all of Crimea go from being a launching point to attack Ukraine to an area that has no troop support, no fuel, no food, no ammo, no nothing. And you trigger hopefully a collapse in the Russian political system because it will become obvious to everyone that the Russians can't even support their own forces. And that is where the bulk of Russian forces are. Uh, they're having a hard time punching south. That, this is the area that the Russians have really concentrated their efforts when it comes to defensive emplacements. So you've got a line of mines and then a line of things like dragon teeth that are anti-tank enforcements and then a network of trenches. And so far, the Ukrainians have proven unable to get past the mines, much less getting through the real defenses. So I don't want to use the word stalled. There's too many pieces in motion, but it's not going great. The eastern punch into places like Bakhmut, that's actually going a lot better because the Russians never bothered fortifying the territories that they've held since 2014. And so, uh, especially when it comes to the more recent gains in this war, places like Bakhmut, the Ukrainians are actually having significant effects. Uh, not enough to achieve the sort of breakthrough that is necessary to break the Russian front, but there is more promising activity there. Uh, but I've got to have a little bit of caution here. Any battle in which the Ukrainians kill three times as many Russians as they lose of their own troops is a battle that the Ukrainians have lost. They're outnumbered massively in this war and between the countries. And the only way that they can win it is by achieving breakthrough, winning a war of movement, and inflicting at least eight to one casualty ratios on the Russians. And that's what we saw last year in places like Kyrgyzstan and Kharkiv. We have not seen anything like that in the offensive to this point. It's not quite an attritional fight. They're still killing a lot more Russians than they're losing, but just not enough. And unless they can break through and force a route, it's difficult to see the counteroffensive in its current form really changing the overall strategic picture unless something new comes into the equation. That might be things like longer range missiles, but from the point that the United States and NATO give those to the Ukrainians, it's a couple of months before they can actually impact the battlefield. So we're already talking best case scenario like September, and the end of fighting season is October because that's when it starts to get muddy again. Um, doesn't mean things can't change. War is all about unpredictable outcomes, but at the moment, I don't see a lot of movement. The, the biggest hope that Ukrainians have right now is that the Wagner effect has removed the best troops the Russians have from the field and introduced a several day interruption in equipment flows. And the Ukrainians are taking advantage of that on the Eastern Front. But if we were gonna see a big break breakthrough, I think if we don't see it in the next week, we're probably not going to.
Let me ask you uh, one more question that somebody asked uh, on, the, on the chat box and also combine it with Russia's seen some of the largest and most consolidated uh, financial sanctions uh, of anybody in recent history. Uh, and it still seems to not have collapsed under the, the weight of its own sanctions. Uh, so regardless of whether or not Ukraine actually succeeds on its counteroffensive or just holds a stalemate, how much longer can Russia withstand the sanctions it's undergoing right now? And then the other question somebody posed in the question was, you think who, about the Nordstrom pipeline? Did we ever figure out who did that? We, you object, uh, said that Russia was responsible for crushing this dam. And what would the impact be if it was discovered that Ukraine uh, had destroyed the Nordstrom pipeline? So those two things together. Sure. Let, let's start with the last stuff. Let's assume the Ukrainians did do it and it's proven. Uh, obviously, that would not be great from a PR point of view, but it would demonstrate a couple of things. Number one, uh, that the Ukrainians are perfectly capable and willing of carrying out extraterritorial attacks. And we've already seen that in several places in Ukraine of late. So from a military point of view, you got to give them some credit. From a diplomatic point of view, the idea that the Ukrainians would have removed from contention the single largest energy artery on the planet and one that the Germans in particular depended upon. Something that we know is that the Swedes know who did this, but they have not said so out loud. Now, I've always thought uh, because it's the Swedes, that the reason they did this is because if you accuse the Russians publicly with proof of doing the attack, then everyone in Europe has to admit that the Russians have de deliberately destroyed uh, European energy infrastructure, and that means you have to cut off all ties overnight. And the Swedes want to make sure Europe has enough time to disengage itself from Russia so it doesn't cause a permanent depression. But let's say the Swedes know that it was the Ukrainians. Well, the Swedes have already told all their allies what they know. It's, it's known at the top, and we haven't had to change a policy out of Europe. So if it was the Ukrainians, there's going to be a lot of uncomfortable conversations to be had publicly, but all of those conversations have already been had privately, and it didn't change the math of the war. Uh, in the aftermath of things like Izium and Bucha, we had a crystallis crystallization in Europe. Um, most European leaders have visited the killing fields of Bucha personally, including the Germans. And so the idea that uh, economics can trump the war at this point, I think we've moved past that. Uh, me personally, I still have no idea. Uh, it doesn't make sense for the Russians to have blown up their own pipeline because that was their single largest energy link and their single largest um, leverage against the Germans early in the war. And it doesn't make sense for the Americans to have done it. Uh, not that we lack the capability and the Germans and the Russians had that too. But if you go back to September 1st of last year, that's when the Russians turned Nord Stream off. And they publicly told the Germans that you now have to choose. You can either have the energy from us and still be modern, but the cost of that is you have to stab Ukraine in the back. Or we just leave it off and you deindustrialize, which is something we're seeing right now. And people forget that the Germans chose to side with Ukraine. They chose to risk deindustrialization and the destruction of their social and economic model in order to remain Western. I don't think they get enough credit for that. And so from the American point of view, we were getting ready a really big hammer because we thought the Germans were going to go the other direction. When they didn't, we're like, oh, we'll just put that down. And then two weeks later, the pipeline was blown up. So from an American point of view, we got everything that we wanted without having to do anything. It doesn't make a lot of sense for us to then blow it up. Uh, my personal theory, I think, and it holds up a little bit better, but it's just a theory, is that Russia's Gazprom did it. Now, Gazprom is Russia's natural gas monopoly. The decision to shut off Nord Stream was made by the Kremlin. It was a political decision. And the way the contracts read for supply to the Germans is if the Russians shut off Nord Stream for any appreciable amount of time, they have to supply compensation to the Germans for the natural gas that was not shipped. And they have to do it at spot market prices, which in the aftermath of September 1 shutoff were seven times what they were before. And so Gazprom was looking down the barrel of a six week period that would take every single cent of their profits for an entire year. So my guess is they blew up their own pipeline in order to trigger force majeure, but that's just a theory. Okay, 
that was all the second part of that. What was the first part? How long can the Russians maintain the financial coherence in the light of all the sanctions? Is that what it was? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Russia celebrates national privation. So this isn't Argentina. This isn't even Turkey. This is a country that prides itself on its ability to suffer. So you have to do a lot of punishment in Russia before you hit a breaking point. And I don't think we're anywhere close to that right now. Also, I was wrong. Uh, we haven't seen disruptions out of the pipeline system so far. Um, and no one has blown up deliberately the pipelines that cross Ukraine. Oh, by the way, that's one reason why I don't think it was the Ukrainians that did it, because they have access to oil and natural gas pipelines that cross their country that are still operational <laughs> that they haven't blown up. Um, and we haven't had a problem with insurance yet. Uh, there hasn't been a single attack by any sovereign state on any Russian tanker, even though they're flowing by Ukraine and flowing by all the NATO countries on their way to India and China. And Indian and Chinese insurance has stepped into the gap to ensure the co ensure coverage for the shipments. We haven't had a single incident where any of that has been called into qu question yet, which honestly is really, really weird because we normally have several incidents a year across the world where shipping insurance has to pay out. So all these replacement insurance systems haven't had to yet, which is just really strange. So I stand by the forecast that this stuff is still incredibly fragile, but I'm very surprised and have been wrong that it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but let me layer one more concern into that. Russia is still getting income from its energy exports, but you have to think about where the stuff is. Um, this is a picture of central Siberia. Uh, it's permafrost. Now, in the south, I realize that this is a completely alien concept, so just bear with me a little bit. Uh, permafrost is in a territory where it's so cold that the subsoil never thaws at all. So you go down somewhere between 5 and 30 feet, and you hit a frozen layer, and ice doesn't drain. So in the summer, when things heat up, the top layer melts, and you get these horizon-spanning bogs. If you want to produce materials in this environment, what you do is you wait for the land to freeze, and you bring out an, a large army of dump trucks with, filled with gravel, sand, and aggregate, and you build berm roads out to a production site, which are those roads that you see going off to the right. You then build a drill pad and drill in the frozen ground through the permafrost uh, down to whatever the deposit is that you're after. This is the highest production cost and the highest maintenance cost for any energy production in the world. It's higher than it is for most deep water. Here's the problem. Permafrost isn't just difficult to develop and maintain. It, the landscape also shifts. So if you get a break, a fissure, where the land can drain in those summer months, you get a slip like this. Or you can get a situation where it drains down instead of laterally and you get a sinkhole. And I put some people up there at the top so you can see the scale. Or you get a situation where you get a hotter melt one year and some of the permafrost actually does melt, not all the way down, but some of it. And in that scenario, you get trapped, rotted swamp vegetation that is very methane rich and the methane gets released and you get a bubble that disrupts the landscape. Now, these things happen in Russia all the time and they disrupt the berm roads and the pipelines. Here's the problem. The Russian educational system collapsed back in 1986. So the youngest suite of people who have the full suite of technical skills to do things like pipeline maintenance, they turned 60 this year. Most of the new oil and natural gas that has come out of Russia in the last 15 to 20 years, hasn't the work hasn't been done by Russians. It's done by Westerners and they're not doing it anymore. So even if the Ukrainians don't blow up infrastructure, even if there's no shipping or insurance issue, the maintenance question is going to kill pretty much all Russian permafrost production anyway. That's two thirds of the total. It's just a question of it happens tomorrow or 10 years from now. And I don't have a prediction for that because that's that's weather. That's not just geology, that's surface geology. But we know it's going to happen sooner or later. And we know the Russians have to lack the capacity to maintain the system without extensive outside help. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. Peter, that's a good segue probably into our next topic, which is oil uh, in areas other than Russia. So could you talk about oil quantities, production in the Middle East, uh, fracking in the United States, uh, shale soils in Canada? Just kind of, can you give us a walkthrough of, of the oil situation in the rest of the world? 
Sure. Let's uh, let's start with the United States because it's the simplest. Uh, the shale revolution is very clearly entering its third phase with the super majors working on efficiency. Uh, Chevron and Exxon both are attempting to double the recovery rates from their wells over the next five years. And even if they only get halfway there, that is another five to six million barrels a day. So I don't think we're anywhere close to sealing the ceiling on what we are capable of with US shale. The biggest problem we've got in that space is that all shale crude is ultra light and ultra sweet. And most of our refiners prefer to deal with heavier and sour crudes. And so at the moment, um, we've got this disconnect where we export the light sweet, we import heavy sour in order to refine. Now, those are becoming closer and closer and closer as refineries are admitting in ever larger volume that we're never going back and that they will always have access to light sweet and they won't necessarily have access to heavy sour. Uh, but that